Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Welcome to the 10th session of our course Yoga and Positive Psychology for Managing Career and Life. In today's session, we will continue our discussion on the ways of attaining well-being in yogic perspective. Well-being is reflection of efficient and effective managing self. That is why we are going to have this discussion about well-being in great detail. Yogic perspective of well-being is very much parallel to the Ayurvedic perspective of well-being. In fact, there are some great scholars like David Frawley, they suggest that yoga and uh, Ayurveda must be understood and practiced in sync with each other, in synergy with each other. Many accomplished and very reputed yoga practitioners and yoga teachers and yoga masters, they are found to be great admirers and supporters of Ayurveda. That is why we are going to look at the idea of good life, idea of happy life and we are taking the references from the Ayurvedic perspective because they are very much in sync with the yogic perspective. So, a quick recap as we do in, in, in all the sessions. we we mentioned about the four factors identified in the Charak Sanhita and other Ayurvedic text. Those are Tattvava Bodh, Indriya Jaya, Sukhayu Hitayu and Dharma Kriya. These are the four ways of attaining well-being and attaining happiness in life. And we also discussed that these four things are connected to each other. And in the last session, we had detailed discussion on Tattvava Bodh and Indriya Jaya. In today's session, we are going to look at the following things. Number one, we will recognize the wisdom as sign of Tattvava Bodh and we will also talk very briefly about the wisdom assessment information. In this session, we are going to explain the idea of dharma kriya, uh, examine the different dimensions of dharma kriya, interrogate the sukhayu hitayu, the, the manifested form of good life or happy life is called to be sukhayu hitayu and we are going to interrogate different characteristics, different elements of the sukhayu and hitayu and we will look at how these four ways of attaining well-being uh, are also very much in line with the current literature about attaining well-being at workplace. So, these four elements, these four ways of attaining uh, uh, happiness in life, uh, well-being in life are equally relevant at workplace as well. That is uh, my claim and that is what I am going to explain towards the end of the session. So, we look at the wisdom and if you recall our last session, we recognized that Tattvava Bodh is reflected in wisdom. So, wisdom has cognitive, affective and cognitive, all three aspects included in it. The very famous paper uh, um, 
in a very reputed journal uh, of uh, journal of uh, uh, American Medical Association JAMA Psychiatry talks about the 6 factors, we discussed these uh, factors in the last session. Uh, those who have registered for the NPTEL course, they must have received a link for the test of the on the wisdom scale. So, this wisdom scale uh, kept it is a longish one, initially it had uh, 114 items and now these uh, this scale is shortened, uh, participants must have received the shortened version. This captures the cognitive, reflective and affective all three aspects of uh, wisdom that is a reflection of Tattvava Bodh. Uh, this is developed by Erdland, uh, very famous scale. So, uh, as you take the scale based on your scores, uh, you must have seen the interpretation of the scores as well. So, for that uh, and that is only for those who have uh, registered for the NPTEL course. Let us look at the third component. Uh, about which we started our discussion uh, in the last class and the third component is dharmyaha kriya. So, this text uh, talks about harsh meaning happiness, the nimitta the reason for that one of the predominant reason for that charak identifies is dharmaya kriya acting according to dharma, action according to dharma and dharma is not religion, dharma is harmony within self and with outside social and natural environment. So, following dharma meaning living and behaving in harmony with self, with social and natural environment and our constant endeavor to transcend our limited ego constantly including so called others in our uh, living in our experience. Uh, so, these, this is in brief uh, dharma is being defined that is uh, we have had discussion about this, this notion of dharma in the previous sessions as well. If we need to look at dharma kriya from this perspective of living this value in lifetime, this can be understood in three dimensions. These three dimensions are dharmic drishti means our perspective, our way of looking at things, dharmic kriya actually the intent or pursuit according to uh, dharmic perspective and dharmic livelihood means action, how we uh, integrate dharma in our day to day actions and day to day dispositions. If you look at the noble eightfold path of Buddha. Uh, this eightfold path also talks about uh, samyak vani, samyak karya or samyak jivika. So, it also talks about right livelihood, right action and right speech and we all know that dharma is a well accepted and anchoring concept in the Buddhist tradition as well. Let us look at these three elements in little more detail. What should be the view, how we should look at world, that is the dharmic drishti, how do I look at the world. So, this drishti is reflected in the classic uh, text and which what we call prasthantrai that is Upanishad and Bhagavad Gita and this is also translated in the Subhashitani, the popular uh, text, popular shlokas which convey the deeper ideas in more understandable language, more operational language. So, this Subhashitani is very famous uh, uh, in India and it goes like Matravat Paradareshu, Paradravyeshu Loshtavat, Atmavat Sarvabhuteshu, Ya Pashyati Sapandita. So, this is the definition of the one who is knowledgeable. Who is the knowledgeable? the one who look at atmavat sarva bhuteshu, who looks at all the bhutas, all the uh, elements of nature as is of his himself or herself. So, that is the sign of ultimate knowledge who does not consider anyone as other, the, all this world is part of me, it is reflection of myself. This is given in Bhagavad Gita as well as Upanishad. 
in the Bhagavad Gita, the famous sloka in the sixth chapter says that ikchhate meaning that who sees yoga yuktatma, the yoga, the one who is with yoga, yoga yukta, yukta means with and yoga means the one who is with yoga, that atma, sarvatra samadarshana, that who looks at everything and everybody with equanimity. So, that is what Bhagavad Gita says, true yogi is the one which who sees everything in self and self in everything, all living being in God and God in all living being. So, Ishopanishad also says like this, yastu sarvani bhutanyatma atmaneva anupashyati bhutanyat so other living beings bhutanya atma manneva like self anupashyati who sees that sarva bhuteshu chatmanam tato viju gupsate the one who looks at everybody all the other organism as self naturally all animosity and all fear will go away in his heart and in his mind. So, these are the signs, these are the uh, examples of dharmic drashti, these are the explanation of the dharmic drashti, how to look at the world. The next part is what to pursue in the world, what is to be pursued, that is the second aspect of dharmic life or dharmya kriya. So, what should be pursued? In life, what is worth pursuing are called purushartha and these are four, dharma, artha, kam and moksha. Dharma as being mentioned uh, many times earlier, it is righteousness, virtue, duty arising from uh, harmony with self and harmony with social and natural environment. Kama is fulfillment of our sensuous pleasure, biological needs and Arth is fulfillment of our social needs that includes material gains, but Arth also in my understanding includes acquisition of social recognition, reputation, all that which has, which brings us reputation in the society. So, social recognition is the reflection, uh, is the form of Arth. Moksha is the liberation, that is a spiritual enlightenment. In yogic tradition, it is realization of uh, Brahman and in general in the Hindu tradition, it is called self-realization. The real self is not which is limited by ignorance, li limit, limited by the uh, ego, but real self is that bigger one. Real self is that which includes everything and awakening to that. So, what? So, liberation from what? Liberation from the limited identity. So, moksha is the liberation from the limited identity to the cosmic or Brahmanic uh, Brahma identity. So, these four aims highlight the harmony of different dimensions. Uh, uh, the indica today's uh, picture is taken from uh, uh, to explain this concept. Uh, indica many of you must be aware is a very active organization which uh, gives courses on the Indian tradition and Indian culture. Uh, in, in one of the lectures, Artha, Kam, Dharma and Moksha are compared with the Maslow's need hierarchy theory. And, uh, Many of you must be aware of the Maslow's need hierarchy theory, which says that human beings live at different needs, which are generally arranged at hierarchical level, physiological need, safety need, need for belongingness, having a self-esteem and self-actualization. Earth, they have compared that with the safety and uh, physiological need. Calm is related to belonging and esteem needs and dharma is related to self-actualization need. There is lot of debate whether needs are actually arranged in hierarch hierarchical manner or not. 
or they might be arising simultaneously. Some people may live at the higher level of needs without actually satisfying lower level of needs. All that debate is there in the Maslow's need hierarchy schema, but this comparison seems to be valid and that is why uh, uh, it is included over here. The comparison of self actualization with dharma is also seems to be valid because self actualization is our ability to be what we can be and dharma is also realization of our true potential and realization of our true nature. And that realization and enacting on that nature in harmony with self and, and in harmony with the social and natural environment. So, that comparison seems to be valid that is why uh, this uh, schema is here to further to understand this idea of the dharma, dharma kriya and how it is connected to the as a one modern concept. None of these four is more or less important. That means, dharma and moksha, they sound adhyatmic, they sound spiritual, kama and earth, they sound mundane, more worldly. None of these four are more or less important. So, in our tradition, avidya is considered the one which is employed, which is about something other than Brahman something other than adhyatma, something other than spiritual that is called avidya. Vidya is considered only that pursuit which is to realize the Brahman or to realize our spiritual self or to awaken and uh, evolve our adhyatmic or spiritual self. In Upanishad, it is said that andham tamah pravishanti ye vidya mupasate tato bhūya iv te tamo ya udvidyāyām ratā that means they who follow avidya enter into gloomy darkness andham tamah pravishanti they enter into the darkness who enter the darkness ye vidyāmnu pāsyati those who only follow the vidya tato bhūya iv te those as well enter into the gloomy darkness who only follow avidya. So, only following vidya and only following avidya both will lead to darkness and the Ishopanishad further in the, in the other mantras says that uh, we have to follow all four vidya and avidya, dharma, artha, kam, moksha. Of course, artha and uh, kam must be governed by, must be limited by, must be disciplined by the dharma and all that should lead to moksha, the liberation, the, that is the ultimate objective and dharma is the pivot around which artha and kam have to be managed. So, that is the second aspect of dharmya kriya. Third aspect of dharmya kriya is right livelihood, dharmic livelihood. Why we enter into livelihood? Why we pursue livelihood? To pursue, to get earth, to, uh, uh, to get prosperity. <coughs> the prosperity in the uh, Indian tradition is reflected in the form of goddess Lakshmi. In the tradition, eight types of Lakshmis are identified. That means, livelihood should be aimed at attaining any or more than one Lakshmis as explained here. So, different form of Lakshmis are Adi Lakshmi that is the central one you see in this picture. Adi Lakshmi is the eternal Lakshmi that gives spiritual pursue that gives spiritual awakening. So, if people are able to integrate their livelihood with their spiritual urge, then that then they get the Adi Lakshmi means the ultimate Lakshmi from where all other Lakshmis actually emanate. Second aspect is Dhana Lakshmi, we all know, we all work for prosperity. Dhanya Lakshmi that which gives food, crop, that is related to Dhanya Lakshmi. Gaja Lakshmi 
that gives cattle power. We all know that even today lot of societies are agrarian societies or societies which are predominantly based on uh, whose economy is predominantly based on the uh, cattle. Uh, Santana Lakshmi, the progeny, uh, progeny is also reflection is a kind of prosperity. Uh, so, that is reflected in this picture with the Lakshmi um, uh, having a small uh, child in her lap. Uh, Veer Lakshmi and Dhari Lakshmi, that is the another form of Lakshmi. Valor, self management, Dhari also means patience. These aspects are also very important in some of the professions, some of the livelihoods. For example, in the armed forces, they pursue valor, they pursue discipline. So, they are actually pursuing Veer Lakshmi or Dhari Lakshmi. <coughs> Jaya Lakshmi and Vijaya Lakshmi, these are the those form of Lakshmis which give power for realizing our Shubha Sankalp, right intentions. Many of us have right intentions, many of us have Shubha Sankalp, many of us wish to do good things. Many a time our Sankalpas, our deep resolve are not able to fructify. And that spiritual power which gives us energy to fructify, to materialize our right intentions, that power is embodied in the form of Jaya Lakshmi or Vijaya Lakshmi. Those who are uh, listening to this lecture, th some of their name also may be like Jaya Lakshmi and Vijaya Lakshmi, these are very common names and uh, last is Vidya Lakshmi, that is knowledge. Uh, so, that form of Lakshmi, that form of livelihood where people pursue knowledge uh, that is blessed by the spiritual power called Vidya Lakshmi. So, livelihood should be in line with acquiring, having Lakshmi, having the blessing of Lakshmi, not acquiring uh, because Lakshmi is form of the mother. You cannot acquire mother. You can only pray to mother or you can uh, only uh, uh, get sneha, get affection from the mother, you cannot acquire mother. So, that is why Lakshmi or prosperity in the yogic tradition is not acquired, it is embraced, it is respected. Uh, so, these are the form of Lakshmi's and interestingly, uh, when this typology was explained in the classical text, somebody would have asked that we see in society people who uh, collect prosperity and collect crop and they attain prosperity even with the unholy means, dishonest ways. Uh, so, will that prosperity be not be called Lakshmi? So, for that prosperity which is attained without following dharma is called a Lakshmi, means that might be money, but that is not qualified to be called Lakshmi. So, a Lakshmi is also one of the terms uh, used to explain this idea of livelihood must be anchored in the righteousness, in the harmony with self and the social and natural environment. Let us look at how Dharma Kriya, Dharmyaha Kriya is in line with the modern positive psychological findings. Dharmyaha Kriya includes realization of self and expression of the power of self, expression of the talent of the self for the well being of all, that is the essence of Dharmyaha Kriya. If we look at the positive psychology, the foundational theory, it also talks about self determination theory. Self determination theory also says that human beings have tendency and power to get the autonomy, they want to have control over their environment, they have another tendency to develop competency. We have had more discussion on this in the second or third session. So, human beings have urge to get autonomy, 
to develop competency and develop belongingness to build groups, to make families, to build communities. All these are natural expressions of human nature. So, in the dharmya kriya as well, people actually realize their autonomy, their competence and their belongingness, the tendency to belongingness uh, with the family, society and community. Uh, the work of Elizabeth Dunn is very interesting in this regard. So, she has looked at the connection between money and happiness. Dunn and colleague have found that happiness and money are connected only to some extent. Beyond that extent, ma additional money does not give us happiness. Actually, it has small negative uh, connection with the happiness. So, when more money can give happiness? Money can give happiness beyond a point, beyond the point where people can fulfill their basic requirements. Money can give happiness only when they are able to use it for the altruistic purpose, when they are able to use it for the social cause. And when they get benefit and when they get happiness by uh, spending money for the social cause social cause is when they have a sense of connection for which they are spending money. So, there has to be some connection, there has to be a sense of connection. Impact, when they see the impact of their work, the positive impact of their work that increases the happiness. Then and third is choice, when they have choice of spending money for a particular purpose, for the particular project which they feel connected to. So, connection, impact and choice, these three things when they are there, then only additional money, additional beyond a point where it satisfies the basic needs, additional money can give happiness only when it is spent with the sense of connection, impact and choice. Uh, work of Bruce Hide is also very, very insightful about Dharmya Kriya. What it says and before we understand the uh, work of uh, Hide and colleagues, we need to understand this uh, a theory called set point theory. Set point theory is the concept or a theoretical proposition based on which at least 25, 30 years people build policies and the whole thinking about happiness was around this set point theory. What it says that people have a set point about their happiness. So, uh, people can be different in terms of their happiness, but what is the point of happiness for a person that remains almost the same. So, if something bad happens in life, they come down uh, to the happiness scale, but then after some time they come back to that set point. Similarly, if something great happens in their life, they their happiness increases for some time, but then after that their happiness level comes to the original level. So, there is a set point, we cannot do much in terms of the policy formulation or some social interventions to enhance the level of happiness of the people. This proposition is seriously challenged by Bruce Hedde and his colleague. What they have done? They looked at the panel data in Germany uh, and this panel data is very extensively collected uh, at the time frame of 30 years. So, they looked at the 30 year time frame about people's satisfaction of life, their uh, life preferences, their uh, life choices. So, it is a very extensive survey and these 30,000 households are involved in this survey. So, instead of looking at year to year regression between life satisfaction, happiness and other factors, they clubbed the data for 5 years. So, they looked at the average of 5 years and what they found that over the years there, there were people whose happiness levels increased. So, that was the major blow to set point theory, which was uh, about 
believing that people generally have one set point of their level of happiness, they found that there are quite a few people whose happiness is actually increasing very significantly in the uh, when we combine the data in the chunk of 5 years. So, the next question was what was increasing, what were the factors behind increase and permanent increase in the happiness and what they found was that economic goals were not explaining the increase in the happiness. There were some non-economic goals which were uh, increasing the uh, which were which were making the permanent increase in the happiness. What was those non-economic goals? Those non-economic goals were social participation, engaging with some socially relevant projects, some social work, uh, some uh, helping with some sections of society, commitment for some larger purpose. These things were associated with increase in the happiness level healthy lifestyle and transferability through parents, these are also two very important factors. People by changing health to the happy lifestyle and that also that includes inclusion of yogic practices in our day to day life, that is found to be associated with the permanent increase in the happiness. One more finding is that the happiness of children is closely associated with the happiness of parents. So, uh, as a parents we can influence just by our personality, we can influence the happiness level of the children just by the way we are. At the same time they found that children could change their level of happiness by their individual efforts. So, it is not only what is uh, received genetically or in the family, children can actually put in effort and enhance their level of happiness by social participation and healthy lifestyle. So, these are some of the interesting findings in the modern positive psychology and the general psychology which suggest that dhanyaha kriya that means working for the social cause, larger purpose is deeply connected nimit what this sutra say is nimit of happiness, nimit of harsh. Here I would like to have a little divergence from the ongoing lecture, we are discussing the different factors of well being and we will continue to discuss but I am tempted to pose this question to uh, uh, all those who are watching this video. If happiness is dependent on so many non-economic factors, so by the way in the general panel data there was no significant difference in the happiness across different professions or across uh, different uh, uh, income groups. So, happiness is dependent and change in the happiness dependent a lot on the non-economic factors. And it is so much so that how we choose our life goal, how we choose and build our relationships, engaging our engagement with the social and natural environment, this is connected with all these things. Then why our education system is predominantly focused on the economic factors and the core professional competencies which are mostly economic in nature why we do not give sufficient input on choosing the life goal more consciously, choosing and building relationship in, uh, in more effective ways and engaging with the social and natural environment. This is just a, a divergence, I hope there is a serious discussion on this aspect of education which is so deeply influential on the quality of life on the level of happiness we live at. So, coming back to the fourth aspect of uh, uh, happiness that is called Sukhayu Hitayu. Uh, you can read little more on this aspect of Ayu and Vaya on the page uh, of this website dharmaviki.org. On this page author explains the difference between Ayu and Vaya. So, age is 
uh, English term, but in Sanskrit and many other Indian languages, there are two terms which are commonly used Ayu and Vaya. Ayu is biological age, Vaya is the corresponding age with the biological age. So, Vaya can be understood in three ways. So, we have a word called Vayu Vraddha means the one who is Vraddha which is grown up who is grown up by Vaya, but there are two other kind of elders Tapo Vraddha and Jnana Vraddha. Tapo Vraddha the one who has done sacrifice for the larger purpose and Jnana Vraddha who is uh, who is more knowledgeable. So, Ayu the quality of Ayu is connected with Hitayu. Sukhayu meaning happy life, Sukh we all know is happiness. This is intertwined with Hitayu, Hitayu means that which is good for others. So, Sukhayu Hitayu are attained together. If, the, if we do not live Hitayu, if our Ayu is not used for the well being and happiness of others, then it cannot be Sukhayu, it will be Dukhayu, life of misery. So, these are the two uh, uh, definitions of Sukhayu Hitayu. Sukhayu is defined as Tratyayuruptam Swalakchanato Yatha Vidhaiva Purvadhyaya Cha. Now, there are characteristics of Sukhayu, and we will look at these characteristics in the Anvaya, in the Sandhi Vichet form, so that we can understand uh, this long sutra word by word. Similarly, Hitayu is defined as Hitai Shanaha Punarbhutanam Paraswada Paratasya. Satya Vadinaha, Shama Parastya, etc., etc. So, there are characteristics of the Hitayu. These both factors go together as per the yogic tradition. So, look at Sukhayu. Sukhayu has these characteristics like Sharir Mana Manasabhyam Rogabhyam Anabhidra Tasya those whose body and mind are disease free yavan vata so if they are disease free how they will look like yavan vata like youth youth like endowed with youth samartha anugata and it has following thing what are those bal virya yash parush parakramasya strength virility reputation, manliness and courage. Jnana, Vijnana, Indriyartha, Bal, endowed with knowledge meaning Jnana and Vijnana that means art and science both, Indriyartha, healthy senses, Artha, uh, object of the sensory perceptions, Bal, ability of the sensory organs, Paramriddhi, riches, Ruchir, Vivid, Upabhogasya, various luxurious articles people can enjoy. Samradha Sarvarambhasya, who can achieve what they start? Many of us are good at taking initiatives, not able to achieve, not able to fulfill that. So, that is also one very important factor of Sukhayu, what our ability to complete and finish what we wish to achieve. Yatheshta vicharinah those who can roam as they please, those who are autonomous, who are psychologically independent of moving around. So, these are the characteristics of Sukhayu. Now, look at the characteristics of Hitayu. Hitaishinah Punar Bhutanam, those who are the well wishers of all being. Paraswadu Paratasya who do not desire wealth of others. And if you remember the first uh, mantra of Ishopanishad also talks about not desiring wealth of others. 
satyavadina who are truthful shamaparasya who are peace loving who are self contained pariksha karinah those who are thoughtful before taking any action they do the pariksha they, they examine the suitability of their action apramatasya who are not uh, lethargic and who are not laid back those who are vigilant trivargam parasparini trivargam we just discussed about dharma arth kaam this is called trivarg result of this doing these things well re naturally results into moksha so that is not uh, counted here that's why it is called tri tri trivarga so trivarg who experience the three important objectives of life that is dharma arth kaam anupaham upaseva manasya without one affecting with others whatever you do people will comment those who are seriously committed for some good cause for them as well some people may comment adversely so the people having ability to ignore those comments without not being affected by those comments that is the uh, characteristic of hitayu because if we get too sensitive and touchy about others comments we will not be able to remain focused on our actual task those who respect superiors those who have gyan vigyan upashama shilasya who are endowed with knowledge and uh, humility vraddha upasevina who serve elder who respect the elders because elders have insights elders can have experience they can give something which in terms of knowledge and insights which you may take years to acquire suniyat who are in full control rag rosh irsha mad maan vegasya so these likes and dislikes jealousy uh, egoisticness egoism egoism these things generally come as vague they come as our uh, uh, dispositions very fast mental waves those who have the ability to control these waves satatam vividha pradan parasya who constantly indulge in various type of charity who has the uh, giving attitude so we many of us must have heard this term go getter the hitayu means not go getter hitayu means go giver who is cons who has the tendency to keep giving whatever in is or her capacity so that is the sign of hitayu tapah gyan prashamam nityasya those who are regularly engaged in the sacrifice regularly engaged in meditation regularly engaged in sadhana not those kind of people who go to gym uh, one week and then they stop going those who start yogic practices and then they stop after 3 days no the hitayu will not get realized in their life we need to have commitment and consistency so those who have this commitment and consistency for the right practices adhyatma vid tat parasya who have the full adhyatmic knowledge who have the commitment to know their true self and realize harmony within that is the sign of hitayu lokam imam cha amu amu cha chegna manasya who work both for the present as well as for the future who have the long term perspective and smriti mati mata who endowed with memory who do not forget the right teachings who do not let go their intelligence and clouded by their impulsive uh, tendencies these are the sign of sukhayu hitayu and what is the sign of dukhayu and ahitayu and only one term is given of what what uh, uh, charak says asukho mato viparyarena those who have opposite of it they get asukhayu or dukhayu or here also gives the opposite definition in the two words ahitamato viparyarena ahitayu is the one which has opposite of all this
and Sukhayu is the one which has opposite of all this. This is the definition of Sukhayu and Hitayu. Let us look at these concepts, the concept of Sukhayu and Hitayu uh, in light of the science of happiness. So, can you recall few concepts we discussed in the very first session? You might recall the concept of hedonism and eudaimonism. Eudaimonic uh, happiness, eudaimonic aspect of life, very popular in the Greek philosophy, also talks about hetayu, the life of virtue. Aristotle also talks about these virtues, virtue as the foundation of ethics as well as foundation of happiness. And these thoughts are very well reflected in the notion of Hitayu. So, if Hitayu that is benevolent life and Sukhayu is the happy life, if benevolent life is happy life, does money feature somewhere in this equation? Certainly, money features, money Im is important. That mean money here means all material possessions, they are important, but they enhance the quality of life only when that money and material possession are directed and used for the larger purpose. If that is not directed, money cannot enhance my happiness. So, ultimately what makes us happy and satisfied? The life goal, social capital, altruistic behavior, these things explain happiness more than money, achievement and power. And that is reflected in the Bruce Hedges research, that is reflected in the Duns research and many, many other research studies. And these are actually suggesting that the schema which was given in the yogic tradition of Sukhayu and Hitayu fits very well with the contemporary knowledge systems. Let us look at how these factors then are connected to career success. So, first look at the Tattvava Bodh. This course is also about managing career. How these four factors which are related to the satisfaction, happiness in life, they are connected to and are they relevant for the career? Let us look at first thing Tattvava Bodh. Knowing a subject, knowing about the essence of the matter, that is the worldly meaning of Tattvava Bodh. If we look at the job performance, it is dependent on three factors, declarative knowledge, procedural knowledge and motivation. Declarative knowledge is the core competency, core technical knowledge. If I am a, a software coding person, professional, I need to know the coding. If I am an advocate, I need to know the law. If I am a uh, scientists, I need to know the science, I need to know the theory and ways of experimenting. That is the declarative knowledge. But there is also something called procedural knowledge. I might be very good at experimentation, I might be very good at law, I might be very good at whatever uh, the job, maybe design, job of designing, job of recording, job of uh, software uh, development, I might be good at that. But in the organization, just knowing my craft is not sufficient. I need to have the procedural knowledge. What is the meaning of procedural knowledge? Procedural knowledge meaning my knowledge about how to pursue an idea or how to pursue an objective within the organizational setting. In all organizations, there are certain hierarchies, organization structure, there is certain type of culture, there are systems and processes whatever I wish to accomplish in my job, it will not get automatically implemented. I need to know the procedure through which I can accomplish thing. I might be having some great idea, but if I know how to pursue this idea, how to put forth this idea, how to uh, uh, shape up this idea in connection with my departmental authorities or in connection with the organizational process and system, I will not be able to implement that idea. So, procedural knowledge is important. Tattvava Bodh talks about both, knowing the essence of a thing. Second aspect, Indriya Jaya. To understand Indriya Jaya, I would like to quote the work of Brook M. Ghoshal, uh, Dr. S late Professor Sumanta Ghoshal, the great management thinker India has produced. Uh, is, is, 
is, is co-author in this project. They looked at most effective and they studied many thousands of the managers in some of the very well known organizations. So, these organizations were like Jet Airways and uh, Boeing and uh, many other very reputed organizations. They studied, Brooke was perhaps his PhD student, they studied hundreds of managers and what they found that all managers are not effic equally efficient. We all know different people operate at different level of effectiveness. What they identified that effectiveness of the managers can be understood by placing them on the two continuum on the two by two matrix. If we put energy in one continuum and focus on another continuum, energy meaning how much uh, vitality with which I pursue a task and uh, focus that means, how long I remain connected and at work at a problem. So, focus and energy seems to be the defining features of the most effective manager. So, people might be looking very busy, but they might not be focused, they might not be giving enough energy, they might not be uh, working with the full intensity. So, that is why the title of their article is also interesting. The title is beware of busy manager. So, busy manager is not necessarily more effective or competent manager. So, what makes people effective and competent at work that is energy and focus. Those who have high energy and high focus they are called purposeful manager and they are the most effective manager and they are in short supply. In their study, they found that there are only 10 percent managers at workplace who can be called purposeful manager. Others and large number of that are distracted managers. Those who have high energy, but they do not have good focus. There are 20 percent who are disengaged, who remain at task, but they do not uh, give sufficient intensity, they do not take that work, they carry out their work with the sufficient intensity. So, they are called disengaged manager and there are people who uh, keep uh, complaining about things, those are generally low on energy as well as focus that is also a big chunk 30 percent in their study were found to be procrastinating managers. how it is connected to Indriya Jaya. Without controlling on the senses and Manas is also considered as Indriya. Without control of Mana and other senses, we cannot remain focused at work. Energy focus matrix reflects the importance of Indriya Jaya. Third aspect is Dharmya Kriya or Dharma Kriya ethics, values, fairness, integrity. These are some of the most important values to remain in job and to grow in the job. In some organizations, people might be having little comparatively lower competency on their professional uh, dispositions. The, the professional proficiency might be little lower but that person can be promoted if the person is high on ethics, values, fairness and integrity and managers who are might be otherwise little higher on the proficiency, professional uh, acumen, but if they are not right, if they are not operating at the higher level of ethics, values, fairness and integrity, they are not promoted. And that is why in large number of organizations along with the uh, professional work, there is an assessment of the things which we can easily club into dharmya kriya. So, I might be doing business, I might be doing my technical work, but if I am not doing it ethically, if I do not follow the organization's values, if I am not fair with my uh, colleagues and my team members and if I do not operate with the integrity, there are less chances, very bleak chances 
that I can grow in the profession. I may grow in the short run, but in the long run, these things get exposed and there are hundreds of studies suggesting that professional career success is deeply connected to all these four aspects. The fourth aspect is Sukhayu Hitayu, means happy life is the benevolent life or benevolent life can be the happy life. We can here discuss only one construct that is called organization citizenship behavior. My willingness to take extra mile, my willingness to walk extra mile to fulfill organizational objectives and my willingness to help my colleagues going out of my regular job description. That is found to be one of the distinguishing features of likability of the people, trustworthiness of the people, innovation by the people. Those who are able to, those who are willing to go extra mile are able to get more insight about their work and they are found to be more innovative. So, many many positive organizational outcomes are connected, they are associated with the organization citizenship behavior which says that hit doing good for others for not want of immediate return is one of the things which makes person effective and successful in his career. Prabhabodh, Indriya Jaya, Dharma Kriya, Sukhayu and Hitayu, those factors were identified many years ago, perhaps many uh, centuries ago. The modern uh, organizational behavior science is validating these aspects and suggesting that these are still important and they are going to remain important in the career as well. So, now look at how yoga completes the positive psychology in light of the definition or in light of the ways of well being what we discussed in this session. One of the things we observe in the positive psychology literature is that we are having some findings here and there about aspects which are related to it. But yoga gives a complete holistic perspective. Still in the positive psychology, we do not have well developed constructs which capture the essence of tattva bodh, but that is the foundation. The foundational element of happiness is knowing, it is captured to some extent in the cognitive behavior therapy, but it is not well connected with the other aspects of the positive psychology. So, yoga and Ayurvedic perspective provides a holistic way of approaching life and approaching career. Yoga also provides physio psychological, ethico moral and psycho spiritual understanding and experience. Yoga by definition is experiential pursuit. So, whereas psychology most of the interventions are limited to manomaya kosha, they are limited to the emotional self, they are to some extent related to some aspects of the vijnanamaya kosha, but mostly they are focused on manomaya kosha. However, we have looked at in the previous sessions that we are not only our mind, emotions and cognition our self is also physical self, our self is also vital self. We do not have interventions in positive psychology on the physical self, vital self or it does not have the interventions at the higher aspects of the cognition, higher aspects of the Vijnanamaya Kosh. Yoga provides intervention for all these aspects, that is why yoga can complete the positive psychology. Yam Niyam are the ways of attaining Indriya Jaya, Dharmaya Kriya, Sukhayu, Hitayu, these are very well captured in the yoga as well. Yoga actually leads to Tattva that is a different level of knowing, that is embodied knowing, that is knowing which is not only related to the concept, at the conceptual level that is not only related to the conscious knowing, it is also deeply connected to the deeper aspect of knowing which are embodied in nature, that is called interoception. So, 
the yoga provides building our in, uh, enhancing our interoception and that is connected to lot many other aspects which are important for success in life and success in career. So, in in nutshell yoga provides a holistic method and approach to attain all three aspects of well being that is hedonistic well being, eudaimonic well being and transcendental well being which is the unique feature of the Indian understanding, yogic understanding of happiness.